Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. It's the weekend and we're waking up with watches. Everything you see here is for sale. Questions about pricing, availability, condition, and box set, reach out to me directly. My email address is tmasso at thewatchbox.com. We're into the holiday season home stretch, guys. Thanksgiving is past. The gift giving season is arriving and it is time to buy, trade, and sell. We do all three. We are looking to build inventory. So if you have a watch you are not wearing, please give us a chance to make you the best possible offer or give you a trade credit. To buy, trade, or sell, reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com. All right, let's start with a big piece. And I don't think pieces come much bigger than a Grubel 4C tourbillon with a 24 second circuit. This is the Grubel 4C tourbillon 24 second vision. It is the 24 second vision, 43.5 millimeters in white gold. It is the GPHG Aguidor winner from 2015. Now, the watch is also a limited edition in white gold. Only 22 were made, and you can see on the reverse side a spectacular domed profile that gives you intimate insight into the underpinnings of the 24-second tourbillon. You can see the bridge bearing it is entirely mirror polished, a specular finish that requires a diamond paste to execute. Note the presence of sharp interior angles at the center flanking a jewel set in a golden chaton, much like you would have found on a vintage pocket watch. Now it is a 24 second tourbillon, which means a turn, a full turn every 24 seconds. Power reserve, you better believe it, three days in spite of the energy intensive complication and the power reserve scale is made out of white gold. We have enormous fired blued screws on this reverse side. You can see more sharp interior angles as well as the barrels that underpin the drivetrain. Again, energy for three days in spite of a high speed tourbillon. You can also appreciate frosting executed on the bridges using a steel brush. The wire brush technique is artisanal and time honored. The bevels are not just sharp sharp and inward, but a mile wide where you find them. And that is German silver used for those bridges. Now on the dial side, we have a dial that is made of solid precious metal and cut on a lathe. We also have a mirrored upper bridge to the tourbillon, which you can see is inclined. Now, whereas the 30 degree tour, or I should say the conventional double tourbillon is angled at 30 degrees, the tourbillon 24 second is actually angled at 25 degrees. They made a few changes. You can see that the cage itself has also been immaculately finished and that the hands have a wonderful fire blued profile. Let's throw it on my wrist, which is 16 centimeters in circumference. And that 24 second, 25 degree tourbillon, in spite of the, the bulbous bulge on the back, it fits easily. This is one of the more wearable Grubel 4C watches. 43.5 is not big by their standards. And the watch is also reasonably thin, surprisingly so, to the point that it would have no trouble fitting underneath the cuff. So that is the Grubel 4C tourbillon 24 second vision, the GPHG Aguidor winner from 2015. Now let's take a look at a legend, a stealthy legend. This is the stealth dial, a Lange und Zona Lange 1, 38.5 millimeters in platinum. This is reference 101.025, and it features a sterling silver dial with lovely fire blued hands. And the stealthy look is commonly associated with Cellini limited editions. You can see we have the hours, minutes, the seconds, the power reserve indicator for the manual wine three day power reserve, and a push button that allows you to cycle the panorama datum or the outsized date. Flip it all over, caliber L901 beautifully rendered in German silver here. They're not plated with rhodium. The Grubel has rhodium plating on its German silver bridges here. It's the naked material. Nickel, copper, and zinc is the actual alloy, and it's the copper that gives it that golden hue. You can see all of the access ports, as well as the edges of the bridges, have been mirror beveled to an extraordinary degree. We have both blued and polished screws, black polish on the escape wheel cock and the regulator, and the note that the balance cock has been entirely freehand engraved. It wears beautifully at 38.5 millimeters. These days, I've seen women wearing men's watches of this size, but with a sterling silver dial and a platinum case, it has a meaty weight to it, and it easily slides underneath a dress cuff. This is Langa's original classic, the first of the trilogy considered to be canonical Langa. People say if you're going to buy three Langas, you get a Langa one, you get a datograph, and a Zeitwerk. Before there was the Dado, before there was the Zeitwerk, there was the Langa one, and that is why has changed precious little since its debut in 1994. 
jumping sideways to something entirely different. This is a watch launched in 2019 and somewhat difficult to describe. It is the Audemars Piguet Millinery Philosophique. Now, the Philosophique, traditionally, is a antique clock with a single hand. Now, in 1982, Audemars Piguet created a wristwatch called the Philosophique that was in a round case that had a single hand. Well, for 2019, two examples of the millinery were modified to feature the Philosophique single hand display. But as you can see, this is quite different from your standard millinery. There is first the frosted gold profile developed in conjunction with Italian jeweler Carolina Bucchi. It is executed by hand using a micro drill that helps to create these divots across the surface, much like sandpaper or frosting or fallen snow. Now, what you can see about AP white gold is that it's whiter than conventional white gold. If we compare this to something like the the Grubel, which was just on, you can see that the AP white gold is whiter. They use either platinum or palladium to make their white gold indistinguishable from platinum. Now, the dial has three things going on. It has a hammered-like texture, almost like the beaten profile of a steel drum. It has a directional grain, and then it's blue galvanized, and because of the shape of those hammered profiles, it is hammered-like, according to AP. You have little recesses that create a gradient, so you have both light and dark blue at the same time. Another feature that's easy to miss is that the sapphire actually sits on top of the bezel. It's not sunken inside the bezel. You can see how on the Longa a moment ago, the sapphire sits below the plane of the bezel. Well, here it has been adhesively attached to the top of the bezel, which means the bezel actually extends some millimeters underneath the sapphire, and there is no conventional bezel framing the sapphire. You can see it in profile. Now, the watch has that eccentric mounted single hand. It is designed to maintain an equidistant stance relative to the indices as the hand takes its circuit around this irregularly shaped dial, and you can see how that works. Now, the watch is approximately 40 millimeters from side to side. That's how I measured it from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock, not including the crown. And it is 43 millimeters from lug tip to lug tip. So while this has been discussed occasionally as a ladies' watch, it doesn't strike me as such. This is the original millinery case size from 1995, and back then it was definitely intended as a men's watch. You can see on my wrist it wears beautifully, and it's flat enough to fit underneath the cuff, a truly handmade watch inside and out, and with the convenience of automatic winding, it has a caliber 3140 automatic winding, free sprung, stop second, full balance bridge, ceramic bearings, 50 hour power reserve. It's the same architecture you'll find in Royal Oak Offshores. It's a movement built for sports watches, but here you can see that it has been fit to the millinery, which means that mechanically this is quite a robust timepiece. What if I told you get a swimmable power reserve flying tourbillon with an eight-day autonomy. You might say, impressive, but not shocking. What if I told you you could have it for under $28,000 on a full bracelet in white gold? That's exactly what we get right here with this Blanc Pain flying tourbillon. The combination of the 2100 series case from the 90s with the Blanc Pain automatic tourbillon movement means that this is a sports watch that you can take swimming that is also a flying tourbillon with a tourbillon designed for Blanc Pain in the late 80s by Vincent Calabrese. We have a date. We have a power reserve. We have that flying tourbillon. And as you could see, it has no upper bridge to block your view. It is entirely black polished. And on the edges of the profile, you can see the cage is been beveled. The screw heads are black polished. We have white gold hands, white gold indices. In fact, we have double indices, and this watch, despite being a clearly a dress complication, has a lot of sports watch characteristics. Plenty of loom, automatic winding, full bracelet, a screw-down crown, 80 meters of water resistance, and an eight-day automatic winding power reserve. It's 38 millimeters in diameter. It's under 47 millimeters from lug tip to lug tip, even with the end length to the bracelet. The bracelet is beautifully made. It's more of a dress bracelet in profile than a, a sports style bracelet. We'll open it up, take a look at the case back. The movement is an absolute gem. So what we have here is the caliber 25 
and that launched in 1998 as an automatic eight-day tourbillon. Vincent Calabrese designed the basic tourbillon architecture for a manual wind blanc pen movement, the 23, back in the late 80s. This is the 25, and you can see not only is the 25 extravagantly decorated, but it features a freehand skeletonized and engraved white gold rotor. The watch is easy to wear, and I dare say unisex in its size. Now, you can put it on a NATO strap and take this thing swimming, or you could leave it on the bracelet and take it to the opera. I can't think of too many tourbillon watches that can do both. It is razor thin and easy to wear. And again, not just under $30,000, but considerably under $30,000, an extraordinary timepiece, the likes of which you will never see again, as I have only seen one like this, exactly like this, in eight years of shooting watches. Eight-day power reserve, automatic winding, flying tourbillon, and you can swim with it. But let's say you want to go swimming, but you want to keep the size to a minimum. You like the history of the Blanc Pan 50 Fathoms, but you don't like the size of the Bathyscaphe and the 5015. Well, set aside the Bathyscaphe 5000, set aside the reference 5015 and its 45 millimeter bulk, because what we have here was launched in 2017, and it might be the right one. 38 millimeters in steel. This is the 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe 38. Now it has the best bezel of any Blanc Pan dive watch. Let's have a listen to this. It sounds incredibly positive. It feels as good as it sounds. It has a ceramic insert, super precise, 120 click. You can see that the watch has plenty of luminescence. It is still a 300 meter diver, and it has a luminescent seconds hand, which frankly, every dive watch should have. I don't know why they don't, but this one gets it right. The strap is easy to wear, sailcloth on the top, rubber on the bottom, and then we get a Frédéric Piguet 1150 movement, two barrels, 100 hours of power reserve, six position adjustment. That's one more than a chronometer. It's free sprung for durability and precise setting. It has an aerodynamic recessed bolt, free sprung balance, and an anti magnetic silicon hairspring. It also features a quick set date. We'll throw it on my wrist and you can see how nicely it wears. It's 38 millimeters in diameter, just over 44 millimeters from lug to lug. And if I were going to buy a bathyscaphe, it probably would be this one. Easy to wear, flat enough to fit underneath the cuffs. So it can also be your dress timepiece. This might be the perfect dive watch, as good as it gets and handsomely finished. I I really need to shout out how good the bevels are on Blanc Pen Frederic Piguet movements. Remember, Frederic Piguet today is manufactured Blanc Pen, so there is some exclusivity there. You can see the rotor has three finishes mirrored anglage, satin channeling around the edges, and media blasting within its hollows. But what I can't get over is the rounded mirrored beveling. Journe and Audemars Piguet should take a lesson. You can make a volume sports watch without ugly machined bevels. That said, I'm not going to beat up entirely on AP, because AP makes a few nice things. And from 2019, the Code 1159 may have been controversial, but the Perpetual Calendar was universally loved, and that's what we have here. 41 millimeters in red gold by 50 millimeters lug to lug. The watch is only 10.9 millimeters thick, and it is full of endearing nuance. We have a Perpetual Calendar with an Aventurine glass dial. We have a matching Aventurine glass moon phase disc, and the moon itself is photorealistic. Applied rose gold indices, matching hands, a weekly calendar in addition to the perpetual. We have evacuated buttress-like lugs. It's like the flying buttresses of a Gothic cathedral. The inner case is a rounded octagon in reference to the Royal Oak, and you can see that the hex screws fixing the bars that hold the strap to the case, those are hexagonal to remind you of the Royal Oak bezel bolts. We have the same fixing the pardon me, let me overcome this little tag we've placed on there. We have the same red gold on the deployant clasp, and you can see it is a trigger-actuated buckle, nicely made. It includes a combination of polish and satination. The detailing is outstanding. As it is here, you can see there's micro-beveling both within and without these lugs. Even internally, you can see the inward-facing bevel, and then you can see that there's beveling on the interior face as well. Take a look at that crystal. It actually dips in the middle. It's got a bit of a dihedral curve to it, so as you look at the way the light refracts, it's unconventional and unique to the model. On the reverse side, you may realize that this year you can no, get the, you can no longer get the original JLC-based 
2120 base in the Royal Oak Jumbo, but you can still get its base right here. This is the 2120 with perpetual calendar doing business as the AP5134. So you still get those gorgeous broad bevels that are gone in the Jumbo's new caliber 7121. Those are ugly machined ledges. Nothing like that here, rounded and beautiful, finished by hand. You can also see the beryllium ring that runs all the way around the movement. This movement was designed in 1967 by JLC for Patek, Audemars, and Vacheron, and only ever used by those brands. And it is a slow process to make this, which is one of the reasons why the Jumbo no longer features it. AP wants to sell more of those. Now you'll only find it on a few marquee complications. By sinking the rotor as close to the bridges, using four ruby rollers or pivot jewels, they're able to create a super thin movement. The base caliber is only 2.4 millimeters thick, and in its day it was one of the thinnest movements in the world, manual or automatic. It has a 40-hour power reserve, a free spring balance, and it beats away at a very vintage-y 19,800 vibrations per hour. You can even see the rotor is quite nice. Interior skeletonized, beveled with sharp inward angles. Money and time were spent there. We'll throw this watch on my wrist. It looks great. It's thinner than you think, and you can really see that well from this angle. Less than 11 millimeters thick. That said, it is fairly broad at about 50 millimeters lug to lug, but you'll have no trouble slipping it underneath the cuff. The blue of entrine and the red gold looks absolutely divine, and it feels expensive on the wrist. But you know what's not expensive? An Omega Seamaster. A great way to get into a professional grade diving watch without mortgaging the house or selling an organ. This is the latest version, debuted in 2018 of the Seamaster Diver 300 meter. Would you believe next year is the 30th anniversary of this design? This design has been enduring to the point that it is almost evergreen. For the first time, Omega can claim it has a Seamaster that has stood the test of time as well as the Submariner from Rolex. Helium escape valve, red gold bezel, red gold Crown. This is Omega's Sedna red gold that will not fade with time. Ceramic bezel insert, ceramic dial, laser cut to create the Omega wave, the James Bond style skeleton hands, 42 millimeters in diameter and 50 millimeters from lug to lug. It wears nicely. It's a rugged and robust piece. As good as the original was in the 90s, this one is better. This watch feels like it could cost $25,000. When I have a full bracelet 50 fathoms or Royal Oak Offshore Diver on my wrist, it feels as solid as this, or I should say the Omega feels as solid as those. You've got a 120 click bezel. It's not quite as positive as the Blanc pen, but it also costs a lot less money. And technically, the movement is more sophisticated. Doesn't have the same power reserve at 55 hours, but it is virtually immune to magnetism. That is amagnetic, highly shock resistant, and unlike the Blanc pen with the 1150, this does have hacking seconds. It also features George Daniels' legendary coaxial escapement, giving you what is probably the most sophisticated escapement you can buy for under $50,000. We'll do a loom shot. What's nice about these is that Omega makes the minute hand and the bezel pearl a different color from the rest of the dial, so you can quickly and easily read the time by night or when you're diving in the dark. Now, the clasp was upgraded for 2018. You still get the fold-out dive extension, but now you also get a push-button slider that gives you 9.6 millimeters of incremental adjustment. And that's just a nice feature to have because it allows you to fine-tune the fit even if you don't have tools handy. Now, let's say you like blue dial sports watches, but you want to go with the industry standard Rolex, but you're a non-standard Rolex collector. That's okay. If, like me, you love the history, but you want something a little bit more offbeat and subversive, then the Milgauss Z Blue is for you. Launched in 2014, it's been left for dead many times by enthusiasts who think it's going to be discontinued every year. Mia culpa, I've made the same claims. It is just so unusual by Rolex standards. First, you have that Z blue dial. There's something otherworldly about it. It's iridescent, electrifying, suggesting perhaps the electricity that creates electromagnetism at CERN, the research facility with its particle accelerators that allegedly inspired the original 50s Milgauss model. Now, it also has orange accents, a lightning bolt seconds hand in orange, and this is a GV or glass vert with the tinted green crystal. So you have green, orange, and blue all in one. Let's take a look at the loom, and you can see that it is all chromolite blue loom, so blue by day, blue by night, 100 meters water resistant, and let's be perfectly honest, the watch is far more than Milgauss anti-magnetic. While it still includes the original's anti-magnetic iron inner cage, paramagnetic, to challenge magnetic fields by effectively leading them around the escapement, that feature has been a constant in Milgauss, 
But today, with an anti-magnetic escapement and a niobium zirconium hairspring, this watch is likely resistant to thousands of Gauss worth of magnetism. So this watch is true to its name, but then some. 40 millimeters in diameter, it's 49.5 millimeters from lug to lug. It's an easy watch to wear, it's about 13 millimeters thick, a really nice piece, and again, a little bit of a subversive choice. If you want to make it more so, go get yourself an Everest or a rubber B strap in light blue or orange, and you can really dress up this piece to pop. The Z Blue, my favorite current production Rolex. If you want something that pops, though, and you would never wear something as mundane as a mainstream watch from Breitling, Omega, or Rolex, and you think even the Holy Trinity are too orthodox, well, let me give you the antidote. Launched, as you see it here in 2006, this is the Gerald Genta Arena by Retro. It is 45 millimeters in diameter in red gold and blue-gray tantalum. It is 100 meters water resistant, so it's a sports watch. It's 54.5 millimeters from lug to lug, but only 12 12.9 millimeters thick, and it has an extraordinary rendition of a Gerard Perigo 3000 series automatic on the back. You may be surprised that a watch this ornate is so water resistant, but it was designed as a sports watch. Now, what happens here is that Gerald Genta used a special finishing, gold gilding and then engine turning. Note here the engine turning is on the bridges and the rotor, uncommon in the industry, and everything has been gold gilded. The beveling is beautiful, the finish is top notch. A GP movement finished by Genta is exactly what you want in a watch like this. Automatic winding with a 45-hour power reserve on this side. You can see that the watch has a screw-down crown. The module is all Genta, and it is a retrograde minute, retrograde date, hence by retro, with a jumping hour. It is exceptionally lively, and as you can see, the watch features stop seconds, so you can set it precisely against a reference time. We have an arc of applied rose gold numerals. We have a push adjuster, so you can adjust the hour without displacing the minute's hand. We we have that little bow style hand for the date and yes the watch retains its underlying Gerard Perigo quick set so you can quick set the date. There's a Ray Hot outboard and you can see whimsically the first 15 seconds are actually calibrated right here as though it's some sort of a diver. You've got that lovely blue-gray brushed tantalum bezel. We'll throw it on my wrist. There's actually a version of this in white gold and tantalum that I want to own. So while it is 45 millimeters, I think I could pull it off. And if your wrist is the same size as mine, I think you could pull it off. It is surprisingly thin. And though Gerald Genta as a brand is only in the first stages of its comeback, and it is coming back, it's important to remember that the former Gerald Genta is today's Bulgari. Same friendly service, same factory, same capability. So if you want this watch serviced, or if you even want a new Gerald Genta branded strap, an OEM strap, you just send it to Bulgari and they hook you up. But let's say you don't want a huge watch, but you want something sporting. You also don't want something as banal as a 5711, but you like the history of the Nautilus. Well, here is your offbeat alternative. If you're like me and you've got that smaller wrist, this is the Nautilus midsize 7118-1A. A model launched in 2015. It is 35.2 millimeters if you measure it diagonally. It's a bit more like 40 if you measure it wingtip to wingtip. So it wears nicely on a smaller wrist. It's 60 meters water resistant, well-loomed, automatic winding, and it 8.9 millimeters thick, super slim. It's got a lovely striated blue dial with large luminescent plots and hands to match. And you can wear it on a small wrist, even as small as 13 centimeters in circumference. We'll take a quick look at this watch in the dark. It is an amusing piece in that regard. By the way, I want to show you something funny. The Genta that you saw a moment ago, you can read it in the dark, including the jumping hour. I'm just saying, if you want the ultimate experience in horological oddity, this is it right here. But I digress. The Patek Philippe is a lovely piece, and it's probably more luminescent than a standard 5711 in the dark, though it has exactly the same standard of finish and the same standard of movement. One could even argue that the caliber 324 is a better fit for this case, and by quite a margin, than it is in the 5711. Still automatic, 45-hour power reserve, quick set date, free sprung, six-position adjustment, silicon hairspring, and guaranteed to run no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day from the factory. So there's a lot of horological street cred here. It's not just the style statement of wearing a Nautilus. Speaking of style statements, 
This is one of them, and it answers the question, what if Max Busser had produced a wristwatch in the 19th century? Well, that was the idea behind 2011's Legacy Machine, a watch with several godfathers that spawned an entire franchise within the MBNF catalog. And this is the Legacy Machine 1 from year 1, 2011, 44 millimeters in rose gold. It has one crown for adjusting the lacquered time zone over at 3 o'clock, and you can see that has the battle axe motif on it. And then there's your travel time time zone. You can see it has a little geosphere motif, and that allows you to set the other time. And of course, because these are fully independent, you can set them to the minute. If you have a really idiosyncratic reference time zone that you're trying to follow, you can set to 15 minutes or 30 minutes. You're not stuck jumping in an hourly increment. Now, there's also a power reserve indicator in spectacular fashion down at 6 o'clock. You can see how it rises toward the top, so I won the watch. 45-hour power reserve. We have an escapement and balance on the dial side. The rest of the movement's on the reverse. You can see that the bridge, as well as the bridge for the escapement, elaborately finished with satination and mirrored beveling. The balance is 14 millimeters in diameter. It beats away at a vintagey and aesthetically pleasing 18,000 vibrations per hour. You can see those recessed bolts. It's a modern free-sprung architecture, and it has a vintage overcoil hair spring profile that allows it to keep consistent time in any physical position. And you can see just how long that balance staff is. And a lot of the 17 millimeter thickness of this watch is that domed sapphire. Now on the reverse side, we credit the friends of Max Busser, Jean-Francois Mojon, formerly a complications developer for IWC, founder and proprietor of Chronode. So Chronode, of course, has made watches for everyone from Chapek to HYT to the Harry Winston Opus series. He handled the engineering of the watch. Kerry Voodelainen handled things like the aesthetics, how it should look, the architecture of the train, the design of the bridges, the breadth of the bevels, and the use of interior angles where bevels meet. We have a pocket watch like center wheel architecture, and the bridges are beautifully elaborated. We have solarization on the crown wheel core as well as the ratchet wheel, beautifully lustrous and gradiated Cote de Genève, black polished screw heads with chamfered slots and circumference, engine turning on the base plate, satination on the wheels. And again, the bevels are particularly fetching. It's a big watch, but it's not actually huge across the wrist. For a 44, a 51 millimeter lug to lug dimension is not offensive. I could wear it. I do think you need a wrist at least my size to wear it well. So let's say 16 centimeters in circumference, but even relative to a cuff because of the way it's sloped, it wears quite nicely and quite easily. And the finishing on the dial side is all the excitement you need. This one's instant converts to the watch collector fraternity. Some watches, like an FP Journe Resonance are inscrutable to non-watch fans. You won't win any converts. Strap a legacy machine to your wrist, and you're going to be a cult leader. Everyone can relate to this watch. Everyone falls in love with it. All right, Patek Philippe. We talked about the Nautilus, but if you want real steel, and maybe you're the type to go his own way, you don't follow the pack, go with a dress watch and steel from Patek. There's a few of them. Uh, this is probably the most interesting. The 5212A, launched in 2019, it's known as the weekly calendar. So you have a day, you have a date, and then you have a little index that traces the outside that gives you a rough approximation of the week as well as the month. The watch is 40 millimeters in diameter, and it has a lovely case design that channels, I believe the vintage reference 2405. I think that's that's what we're looking at. I think that's where these stepped lugs came from. They're beautifully tapered. The watch is 40 millimeters in diameter. And what's intriguing about this dial is that the hands as well as the indices are white gold and blackened. The dial base is a sort of cream or ecru. And the actual font for the numerals and the letters, you can see it looks handwritten. And that's because it was, at least in original copy, the prototypes of the watch featured handwritten features created by a staffer at Patek Philippe, and they liked the look of it so much that they stuck with the font created by hand by that employee, and that became the dial of the watch. This was also the debut of a new movement for Patek, the caliber 26330 
and this is the SC. Well, it's a little bit more than that, but it has center seconds, among other things, and a calendar. It also has hacking seconds, which is something previously not featured on caliber 324. This is a modified 324, so everything that's good about the 324 is present and correct here, but you get the ability to stop the balance and set the watch precisely to a reference time. And again, as with the Nautilus, because this is a latest spec Patek manufacturer movement, guaranteed accurate, minus three plus two seconds per 24 hours, and it fits easily underneath the cuff. And you can see that well. This is a great watch if you want something lower profile with all the history, heritage, and standards of Patek, but without the Instagram new money imagery of a Nautilus. Okay, this was the thumbnail watch, and I'm actually not opening or closing with the thumbnail watch because I have something so spectacular, you'll instantly understand why I saved it for last. But this is a rock star watch right now. A timepiece already discontinued, at least in as much as the Tiffany teal dial is no longer available with the 41 millimeter case. This is the Oyster Perpetual 41. It came out in 2020, and to be perfectly honest, this is the dial that Rolex describes as turquoise, but everyone and his mother associates it with Tiffany turquoise or Tiffany teal, which for a long time was bosom buddies with Rolex before their breakup in the mid-1990s. For a long time, Tiffany would co-brand Rolex watches sold through Tiffany. Rolex didn't like that, ended the relationship. However, in 2020, as a sort of tacit nod to that golden era, Rolex launched this, and it is the most sought of the OP41s. And again, you can't get the 41 with this dial anymore. You can still get the 36, but not the big boy. It wears broad, 51 millimeters lug to lug means this is a lot more like a GMT, a Submariner, or even an Explorer too. But it's not thick like those are. It's got a domed bezel. It's under 12 millimeters thick. It's got a wonderful presence. It's got plenty of luminescence. It's bright blue by day, and as you can see, it's also bright blue by night with Rolex Chromalite. It's got a 70-hour power reserve, 100-meter water resistance, shock resistant, anti-magnetic. Everything you see is Rolex, and one of the big changes for this generation of the Oyster Perpetual wasn't so much the dial or the case size, though those were both new. It was the newly available Easy Link, a feature five millimeters in, five millimeters out for fine adjustment, previously not included on the Oyster Perpetual models, which were regarded as somewhat stripped down entry level pieces. No longer. This is now a rock star. I should also be honest, people were charging up to $50,000 for these at the height of the silly season back in February, March, and April. Today, a more realistic price range is going to be $20,000 to $24,000. Anyone who's charging more than that is probably still living in the silly season. The prices on these have come down. Nevertheless, if you wanted to get the same basic watch, it's still a retail of $6,150. And of all of the current generation OP41s, this one is still the best long-term collector prospect if you have the discipline and the attention span to buy and hold. Okay, speaking of attention span, do I have yours? This, previewed in 2010, but not launched until 2014, is the Chagere LeCoult Master Compressor Extreme Lab 2. As you see it with ceramic bezel in black and rose gold case, this was a limited edition. You can see on the reverse side, each one individually numbered out of 200, a watch whose movement alone has 569 pieces. Let's find out why. First, the crown does not pull out, so you may ask, how do you hack it? You have a hacking lever on the flank. Second, if the crown doesn't pull out, how do you cycle setting modes? Easy. There's a secondary column wheel for the function selector, like a Richard Mille. This is, or, well, a Richard Mille or an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak concept. This has a multi-mode crown. Now, in one position, I can set all of the hands in sync. In the other position, I can wind the watch. Note, the power reserve indicator is an arc over the top of the dial. Note as I wind that the power reserve turns from a copper bronze to white. 65 hour power reserve. It also has automatic winding on the reverse side. Flip back to the dial side. What's going on here? Well, how about I put it in GMT mode? So now I can set my local time independently of the stub secondary time zone. And that is important to note. You have two time zones, settable 
independently. We also have a 60 minute chronograph register and we have a digital jumping chronograph mint display. The chronograph hours feature a 24 hour format, which means unlike a conventional chrono, which only gives you 12, here JLC gives you 24. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that out of the way. There is also a little indicator down at 6 o'clock, and that is your day-night indicator for that stub second time zone. So you can see that little stub hand right there. So it's in a 12-hour format as it circles the dial, but you do have 24-hour clarity for that second time zone down at 6 o'clock. You also have a coaxial small seconds indicator over on the hour display. The movement is skeletonized and ruthenium coated. It is beautifully hand-finished. The watch is also dramatically loomed. As you can see, a true sports watch will have no trouble reading it in the dark. It is also 100 meters water resistant. You could see that the actual chronograph triggers are underneath shear guards that protect those from impact, and the case internally has a Richard Mille-like security against shock. You can see there's a ceramic bezel to resist scratches. The case is approximately 46.4 millimeters, but it wears nice and small, and I'll show you that in a moment. There is a ratcheting system for the strap, and the watch comes with a second accessory strap in leather and textile. That never gets old. Flip it over. You can see how you swap the straps. There's a little shutter that you pull up. Once you've pulled up the shutter, you remove the strap. It's that simple, just like that. The movement is designed for impact. In addition to being braced against impact uh, via the fixtures that connect it to the case, you can see it has a free sprung balance and a full balance bridge. Column wheel vertical clutch chronograph with the column wheel visible. And we have a platinum iridium rotor mass to maximize winding efficiency. Take a quick look at the buckle. A couple of things going on here. Here. First, you have the ability to adjust it short and long. As you can move it in or out, you just align this little cam and it allows you to move the buckle in or out. So you can actually move the buckle in or out to change the fit, to fine tune the fit. You also have a removal if you slide the cam to release, the strap will pop out of the buckle. So you can remove the strap from the case and then remove the buckle from the strap and swap over to the other strap that's included with the watch. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put the strap back on and I'm going to show you what the watch looks like on my wrist. This is always easier to do if you have more fingernail than I have. I sacrifice my fingernails for beauty so you guys don't have to deal with my uncouth manicures. So I pop the strap back in. By the way, that little pin buckle is a four-figure accessory if you want to buy it as an accessory from JLC. It is the most over-engineered pin buckle in the world. Taking a quick look at the watch on the wrist, it fits. If your wrist is my size or larger, you're going to be able to wear this watch, and you're going to have a lot of explaining to do in the office because your watch nerd buddies have never seen anything like this. And as I've often said of this model, if Richard Meal made this thing, it would cost a million bucks. Reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.